Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today attended what is now the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and received a BFA in painting and drawing. She worked in advertising for a few years and then went back to college to receive a teaching certificate. While teaching high school in Ardmore, Pennsylvania, known for Kobe Bryant and a few other luminaries, yes, he was in her homeroom for four years, she left due to COVID and no vaccine available at the time. Since retiring, in addition to writing her first book, she volunteers for charities, gardens, and occasionally cleans her house from years of stuff. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Louise Pierce. Well, thank you so much, Julia. I'm so glad to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity. Louise, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? I was busy. Um, I was teaching full-time, which is, you know, all-consuming in many ways. Uh, Both of our mothers, my husband and and mine, um, were widows and needed a lot of attention. And I had a kid, you know, I had a son who I had him late in life. I was 37 when he was born. So, you know, we were still involved in high school, college, all those kinds of things while it was all going on. So every minute of every day seemed to be busy. I'm also an artist. So I did artwork as well in any spare time I had, I was doing artwork and, um, you know, not enough of that either, but I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to write a book and the pandemic leaving, you know, teaching because of it. um, Suddenly, you know, you're in the house, we were all in lockdown and I was a little annoyed that I had to leave my job because um, we were teaching online initially and I was absolutely fine with that. And then the district I taught in wanted us to go back that September, even though there weren't any children in the classroom. Um, And the vaccine wasn't out yet. And I was 62 years old. And I just thought, why am I going to put myself at risk? I had become eligible to retire that January previously. And even though I wasn't planning on it, I still loved my job. Um, you know, after talking it over with my family, we decided the best thing for me to do was retire. So there I was kind of locked in the house and um, still thinking about teaching a lot at that point. I was considering teaching college, um, had been offered a position. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do that for when I didn't want to teach, you know, in, in high school, what's the difference? So I didn't do that. And I decided to try to impart all the things that I wish someone had told me when I started teaching, not the things that you expect to be told, you know, not what you learn in school, but basically how to survive while doing the job, all the little things. And uh, so I just started writing it down. And after I had several chapters written, I sent it to my then principal, my former principal, Sean Hughes, his name was, and um, he was a great guy. And he probably read more educational literature than anyone I've ever known. And I sent it to him and I said, is this anything or, you know, because when you write something, as you know, being an author, 
you don't know whether it's garbage or whether it's the best thing that's ever been put on paper. By the time you're done with it, you're like, I, I have no idea what this is. So I sent it to him and I said, is this anything? Is it worth pursuing? And he said, oh my gosh, yeah, it's terrific. Keep going. So he gave me some notes and stuff and I, I kept going with it. And um, unfortunately, he was killed in a car accident before I finished the book. Um, it was just a horrible, horrible tragedy. And um, the school really still hasn't recovered. He was one of those big personalities, you know, and a very good friend. Um, anyway, so I kept going, kept going and uh, gave it to my son, who was a history major and who does a lot of writing and said, would you edit this for me? So he gave me a bunch of notes and I edited from his notes. And then I started to look for how to get it published. Apparently every single person in the world has written a book during the pandemic. So they were all entirely overwhelmed. So many places were saying we're not accepting manuscripts. And especially in the education business, um, I looked at educational publishers, this, that, and the other. Many were not accepting books. And the ones that were, I felt like you had to jump through so many hoops. And since my book is different, I was just really afraid it was going to be, I guess fear was a big part of why I didn't send it to them. But I'm an administrator on the We Love Memoirs Facebook page. And the, it's people all over the world and they're just amazing uh, It. I don't know if you have ever gone on there, but I highly recommend it to people. Um, the friendliest group of people you ever want to meet. And one of the people on there is an author and a publisher, Victoria Tweed with Ant, Ant Press is what the name of the publishing house is. So I thought, well, you know, let me just send her a chapter. She can just say, I don't want to read it, you know, or I don't want to see it, whatever. So I... I talked to her about, it. I said, could I send you a chapter of my book? And she said, yes. So I sent it to her and she said, we would love to help you publish this book. So I thought, well, it's kind of like self-publishing, but this way she had an editor pub, uh, edit it. So it was professionally edited. And then she formatted, she did all the wonderful things about it. Um, and then all of a sudden the whole thing just, started to happen really quickly. So I was doing illustrations for the book and suddenly I had to do a lot, you know, do it fast. And so it all came together like within two weeks, it was really crazy. And uh, then, um, so the editor edited the book, sent it back to me and I changed some of it back to the way it was because it had lost a little bit of my voice and I wanted that in there. Um, <clears throat> And then I sent it back and she published it, but it says it's published by me because I don't know why exactly, but I guess she wanted me to be in control of the rights and everything. So, and that was absolutely fine with me. It was, she was wonderful to work with. Um, and so that's the story of how it happened. Well, it's always nice to have a partner in this crazy humbling industry. And we have so many options today. Uh, to publish and that that increases the number of books that are out there but it also is a, a huge learning curve for everyone as well it certainly is you know my mother was a teacher I was a teacher and now I have a daughter who's a wonderful teacher so we just appreciate your influence on young people and all of your years in the classroom. And you certainly have written a book that's kind of a love story to the teachers. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, is it a how to survive, as you said, or what, what would be some of the chapters that you have in the book? Well, it, it, it's a little bit of both. It's a, it's a love, it's a love song of to teaching, you know, to the profession. Um, because it's such a necessary profession, as we learned during the pandemic. And all we heard was the kids need to be back in the classroom. And I think it was much more than just from the babysitting aspects of it. Um, 
it was from what I'm hearing from people who are still in the classroom when the children come back from being out for two years, there's a lot of civilization about it. They've, they've lost a lot of their, uh, you know, emotional intelligence and how to interact with people. And I think teachers really do civilize kids to a great extent, you know, teach them how to be in the world. Um, and not just through, you know, discipline, I mean, but through modeling behavior and through what they're learning in the classroom. So um, I think that more than ever, we see how essential teachers are. And unfortunately, many people are leaving the profession um, or not going into the profession because of what has been done to the profession. And so I've written this book in the hopes of encouraging people to go into it and to um, help the people who are there to uplift. This book is to uplift teachers, um, to help them through sticky situations and to help them to really um, appreciate what they have because I wasn't a teacher all my career. I worked in advertising. And that's a dog eat dog world. And any type of business, I was also in a couple retail situations and things like that. And when I came to teaching, it was very difficult, of course. It's it's not an easy job, but it was so much more um I keep using the word civilized, but it 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 was much a much more civilized. Exactly. Mm-hmm. There's not the competitiveness so much. There's not, um, there's respect between people. I wasn't sexually harassed any longer, you know, (laughs) things like that. Uh, They just didn't happen. And it was such a relief to be in an atmosphere where I was appreciated for myself rather than, um, you know, other things that weren't important. But my chapters are uh, in the book, The first one is love, which I'll read to you in a bit. Um, Not delivering information because you're not just there to deliver information. You're there to teach information and how you impart it is so much more important. You can read a Wikipedia page for information, but to actually learn something, it has to be coached and, you know, brought to life. Um, the nuts and bolts of the day is one of those things about, you know, if you're one of those people, like I was a night person, make your lunch the night before lay out your clothes, you know, literally how to get yourself through and up and all that stuff. Um, personal warmth. I talk about how important that is in the teaching profession. And if you don't have it, you can learn it. Um, how to have thick skin. Uh, which is essential. Um, Logic and linear progression is another how to teach thing. I have a chapter about administrators, um, how to get along and support staff and who are essential to your well-being as a teacher. Um, Having no fear, because I think fear plays a great part in some people who are not successful as teachers. Because when you're faced with a classroom, I mean, I taught high school and you can be faced with a classroom of surly 15 year olds, you know, at 730 in the morning and it's intimidating, you know, and they're not going to inside. They want you to be a great teacher, but they're not going to show any of that on their face, you know, so you have to learn how to have enough confidence in yourself or at least fake confidence to be able to engage students, Um, meet them where they are, which is essential in that you have to meet the students where they come in with what they come in with instead of them, you have expectations and they have to live up to them. You have to take them from where they are to where they can go. And oftentimes there are 25 different places that they are when they come in 
And you have to figure out what those places are. So I talk about that. I think that's one of the most crucial things that teachers do in the classroom. You know, they're every day when my students would walk in, I would wonder where they had come from, you know, what horrific situations some of them were in and how they even made it to the school building, you know, was a miracle in itself. And I just wanted that classroom to be a safe space. And I wanted them to be able to learn without any, you know, fear. And uh, I, I think that's so crucial. Absolutely. It's it. It is the most important thing. Um, modern references, I talk about how to bring the world into the classroom because you're not teaching in a vacuum. Um, how to tune out noise, which is talking about where you're teaching um, in that the community sometimes is creating a lot of brouhaha that is not essential to what you're doing. And to just not pay attention to that. I uh, talk about unions and um, how important they are to be a part of, if it's possible. Um, I talk about being organized as a person, how organization yeah. helps you. Uh, I talk about not complaining because I have a whole chapter about don't complain <laughs> because it's because it creates an atmosphere that is negative. Um, room decor was a big one. And that goes back to making kids feel safe. Because if you make a room a hospitable place, uh, a place that feels warm and comforting, I would see kids walk in my room and watch their shoulders come down. So they knew they could relax. And it was more than anything, what they saw when they first walked in. Um, P's and Q's, and that's about, my mom used to say, mind your P's and Q's. And I just give a little advice with that as far as in your career. I talk about the power teachers have. I actually talk about reading in this and reading for empathy because we know how much reading increases a person's empathy and the kinds of things that they can read and um, how it enriches. Then the title of the book is not a contest and there's a chapter about that. And that is that you're not there trying to compete with anyone, especially your students. It's not a, you know, um, oh, I won, uh, you know, I put that kid in its in his place or whatever, you know, that's not what we're there for. It's not, and, and I think sometimes it becomes that without a person knowing it. Or the opposite, to try to be, you know, such a friend to the students mm -hmm. that, that you can't be, you can be friendly and you can, you know, care for them, but you can't be on their level of friend because then you lose, you know, that teacher student uh, separation, I think. Absolutely. There is a power dynamic to it and it has to be maintained. Otherwise, you know, you, uh, you lose the dynamic that needs to be there. Um, the only constant is change. I talk about how that's something that in education is constantly changing. So you just have to keep going with that. And then I talk about bravery at the end. Well, it sounds like you've covered all the bases and, and will certainly be a wonderful handbook for not only new teachers, but those who need a little refresh in their lives. Uh, I think sometimes it can be discouraging in classrooms. And so I think lifting up our teachers is something that we truly need to do. We want to hear just a tidbit about your having Kobe Bryant in your classroom. Because <laughs> he probably caused quite a stir in that high school with his many national awards and even taking R&B singer Brandy to his senior mm -hmm. prom. So how yep. was how was having Kobe in your classroom for four years? Um, he was a really wonderful kid. Um I actually coached his two older sisters in volleyball, Shea and Sharia, and they were, they are lovely people. 
uh, I still talk to Shaya and uh, Sharia sometimes. And um, they, so I, I kind of knew the family before he even got to the high school. And then he was in my homeroom and um, he would come to school at six o'clock in the morning every day to practice in the gym. He was throwing th- free throws from six o'clock in the morning till seven thirty when school started. So he was often late to the homeroom, but I didn't mind because I knew where he was because I'd seen him on my way in, you know, when he was, when I was going to sign in, he was throwing free throws in the gym. Um, always polite, always polite. Um, he started to get a lot of attention by, you know, his sophomore year. There was a lot of attention by the kids and by the outside world. Um, he handled it pretty well. Um, I'm sure that was difficult. I mean, because they'd been living in Italy. They spoke Italian to each other. It's a fascinating story. Their family story is is quite fascinating. And and I can just imagine that that had to be um, quite significant in that high school, all the publicity that came to it. But speaking of publicity... Is there anything that you found for your book that has worked or maybe that mm. even didn't work? Um, well, BookBub didn't work very well. I spent $100 in BookBub. I sold like three books, so it certainly didn't make up for. I think my book is a really hard. It, it's hard because it doesn't fit a mold. It's not an educational book, per se. It's not a memoir. It's certainly not fiction. Uh, although sometimes it may read as it, but it's not, um, it's hard for me to find a place to put it, you know, to advertise it. Um, I just paid the other night for a Kirkus review. I'm hoping that that helps. I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see because I need to be able to get this out. People, when they get it or they, um, like people that I know that have told, oh, I wrote a book and they buy it. They're like, wow, this book is great. And in fact, some of the top educators in the country have bought it. Um, I had a former superintendent, Dr. David McGill, who was who was a superintendent at our school, at our school district. And then he went on to be at the Chicago Experimental School. It's a world famous school. And he was the head master there. And unbeknownst to me, he bought it, read it, and he sent he said everyone that's in the education field should have to read this book well there's your quote there's your quote right there that you can use in any any place that you use publicity you know on social media or your facebook page or anything like that you know you use that quote ask him if you can use the quote in his name and then you know i can see you go into you know teachers conferences and setting up a table Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of at a loss. I dropped one off at every school district that was nearby and never heard a word. Um, I think it's too much of a teacher's book for administrators to give to teachers to read. It's it's too much on the ground, you know, that this is this is a, a lifting up teachers book. And I I feel like administrators are not wanting them to read it particularly, or they don't think it's important enough to read. Well, I would see if you could find a patron who can buy copies of your book and then go put them in all those teachers' mailboxes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They, well, they my, need yeah. to have them. They need to have it's, them. I've been that patron in some cases. I dropped some off at my old school and, you know, gave them to people that I was friends with. But yeah, it's, it's uh, it's difficult. I, I imagine I, w- I would like to write a fiction book because anyone that knows me will tell you I read more than a person should. And um, mostly fiction. I love fiction and I would like to write one. But after yeah. uh, maybe it won't be so daunting. I don't know. You write fiction, don't you? Well, uh, the first book is is learning your craft, which you've done now. And so you can dev into fiction next. It's a different mm-hmm. animal, but you can do it. Why don't you tell us about the passages that you've brought to share today and read from your book so we can hear your tone and voice? Um, 
I thought I'd read you the first chapter, which is love, which is kind of the crux of the whole, the whole thing. Um, the chapter's just called love. And here it is. The first thing to talk about as a teacher is love. Yes, you read that right, love. You need to love your fellow human beings enough to care to teach them something. You need to love the subject or subjects that you teach enough to care to impart that knowledge to your fellow human beings. Love will get you through all the bad things about teaching and love will enhance all the good things. This is a profession based on human contact. And if you don't embrace it all with genuine love, it is not the profession for you. Sure, you can learn things from a book or computer, so much so that there is constant talk of teachers being replaced by computers. Unenlightened people believe that such replacement is possible and maybe even a good thing. But education is about so much more than relaying information. First and foremost, it is about human connection. If the pandemic taught us anything at all, it taught us that. Louise, I, I think that we all need to hear that today. And I don't think it's just for teachers. You know, I think our society has lost love of our fellow beings and, and it's so difficult these days for anyone to be kind. And so I, I think that's an excellent way to start your book and, and a wonderful way for us to, to think about love and, and, and everyone that's in our path today. I I have to agree. Yeah. Um, and tell, I mean, if, if nothing else, uh, just in the world tolerance, Exactly. That that word has gone out the window just because you don't believe the way I believe we can still agree to disagree, you know, mm -hmm. and um, our society doesn't teach that anymore. Well, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50 are a unique set. Do you have any advice for writers 50 and above? Just do it. Not to sound like a Nike ad, but um the, the We Love Memoirs Facebook page helped me with that because I saw people writing all, all over the place and all kinds of books and they just did it. And so when you're ready, when you think you have an idea, when, you know, I don't work from a lot of, I made an outline and then just wrote from there. I just sat down and wrote and then you, you, you refine. But um, if you have a book in you, get it out, just do it. And, you know, I'm just so delighted to have a book. In, and of course, I'd like it to sell more, but it's sold, it's sold okay, you know, but, um, but the thing is, it's just so delightful. I feel like, you know, if I passed away tomorrow, at least there would be this piece of me left. And you don't want to, you don't want to, pa you know, as you get over 50, you start to think about that a little bit more and you don't want to pass away with things not done. So get it done. I certainly agree. And I think your legacy is not only your book, but all the, the love that you put into those classrooms for 30 years and all those students who benefited from your wisdom and from your caring about them. So we just appreciate you as a teacher and we appreciate your service in the classroom. And now we're happy to say that you're one of our authors over 50. Thank you so much, Julie. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third. <laughs>